The manhua starts with Director Lee telling our main character, Seo Yeonwoo, that he's pretty sure he called her about 30 minutes ago. But Yeonwoo, sadly, tells him she was busy eating lunch, so she couldn't check her messages right away. Now, here's the twist, she's actually lying. She read his messages like an hour ago. And get this, she knew he just got back from Dubai after being away for like 40 days. And guess what? He came straight to his office from the Incheon airport. For like the last two days, he's been shooting her his schedule in these short texts. He's not the type to go on and on, just a few words at a time. But here's the thing, she's so tuned in, she can totally figure out what he's getting at just from the little preview she gets in her messages. And even though he's not mentioning anything about them spending the night together in those texts, she knows deep down that's why he's bothering with the whole schedule thing in the first place. The reason for all this drama is that they've been sneaking around and hooking up in all sorts of places, the office, his car, even her place. She was thinking of avoiding him, you know, just to stand her ground a bit, but then bam. He hits her up with a message earlier, crushing her little rebellion. This guy, he's the type who can pull off anything he sets his mind to, especially when he's acting all cool in front of her colleagues. And just when she's lost in her thoughts, Lee snaps her right back to reality. He casually asks her about lunch, and she nods, claiming it was good. But he sees through her facade, noting she only meets his gaze when she's not telling the truth. There's a tension between them, a desire for more, and she wonders how much longer she can keep this up. Despite the complexities, they've held on, unable to let each other go. Yet, in their encounters, Desire is the only emotion that truly lingers. Then, in a bold move, he pulls her close, initiating a passionate kiss that catches her off guard. Their relationship is like that, complicated and intense. Lee takes on the role of teacher, showing her the ropes of kissing and urging her to be more convincing if she's going to play the part. He's not one to wait around, he mentions waiting for 40 days, implying he's eager for more. Lee comes off as the type who needs to have wild intimacy multiple times a week to feel satisfied. It's all about passion and fulfillment for him. Yeonwa mentions his secretary's waiting outside, but he couldn't care less. He boldly declares that he's with his woman at the moment. Yep, Yeonwu is his secret lady, his partner in, well, you know. But truth be told, they are total opposites. He's this big shot heir to a corporation while she's just a lonely orphan. It's like they are from different worlds. And because of that, the end to this one-sided relationship seems pretty much set in stone. She's wondering how much longer she has to keep up this relationship. Then Lee gives her a new stocking, saying he doesn't want other guys catching a glimpse of her bare skin. She promises to switch them out for different ones. She quickly zips up her skirt, and Lee drops a bomb, saying a quick romp in the office isn't cutting it for him anymore. He gently strokes her face and mentions swinging by her place later. But she's not feeling it and tells him she'd rather he didn't come over anymore. So, he suggests they grab dinner at a hotel instead. Yeonwoo's worried about gossip starting if they are seen out together like that. She suggests going to his place instead, but he insists on sending a driver, which she turns down. While in the bathroom, an employee pops in and asks Yeonwoo if her stomach is feeling better now. She mentions she picked up some medicine from the convenience store on her way back. Yeonwoo assures her that she's fine now, mentioning she already got some meds from the office. But the lady insists she should still take it, just to be safe. Then she reminds Yeonwoo about their meeting starting for PR Team 2. In this meeting for Team 2, one of the staff pipes up and asks if anyone heard what went down when Director Lee showed up at the office today. Apparently, word on the street is he just got back from Dubai, all successful and whatnot, and headed straight to the office. One of the staff is straight up questioning the manager, asking how he plans to navigate office politics if he's always in the dark. She heard the whole board of directors ditched lunch just to welcome Director Lee back in the lobby. 
And get this, even the manager of PR Team One, Sung, was in on it. It's like a full-on party for Director Lee. Rumor has it, he's getting promoted to vice president thanks to that Dubai project. Things are moving crazy fast, huh? Meanwhile, the heir of Sung Han Construction is still just chilling as a regular employee. It's kinda weird, right? But then again, Director Lee is being groomed for a leadership role to replace the old president who's always causing chaos. So, there's gotta be a good reason why the chairman picked Director Lee over all his other grandkids. Right as they are gearing up for the meeting, this guy on the team throws a curveball and asks manager Jung about a juicy rumor. Apparently, someone on the general affairs team is dating their boss. Yeon was caught off guard, and the lady staff chimes in, saying that rumor's been floating around for a while now. It's tricky, though, cause they can't really tell just by watching them. They probably had to sneak around to meet up, or else people would start gossiping about favoritism and all that jazz. But who knows if the boss actually pulled any strings with HR. Yeon was thinking to herself that both the employee and boss already denied those rumors, and manager Jung should know that too. She gets this chill down her spine as she hears the staff gossiping about someone on their team possibly having a secret fling with their boss. And just as she suspected, that lady staff member did catch them together before. As Yeon Wu is holding a document, the lady suggests she take it instead since she's not feeling great today. She looks kinda pale, poor thing. Yeon Wu hands over the document, and then the lady sighs, saying she wishes she was as pretty as Yeon Wu. So, while the lady is chatting with another staffer and dropping hints about Yeon Wu, Director Lee strolls in. He walks by them and sneakily brushes Yeon Wu's hand with his own. But, uh oh, the nosy staffer catches it all. Meanwhile, manager Jung Mi Hyun, who used to be a screenwriter, is like the ultimate gossip guru in the company. She knows all the juicy deets. The busybody staffer is spilling the tea to the other lady, claiming that the construction company air everyone's been gossiping about getting hitched soon is actually Director Lee. The other lady isn't so sure, but the busybody staffer argues her case. She's like, why else would he have Cartier make a pair of rings? It's not like he's gonna rock two identical rings, right? It's gotta mean he's tying the knot soon. Later that day, Yeon Wu heads over to Lee's place. He answers the door and asks if she's had dinner yet. Then, he pulls out this fancy wine he got as a gift in Dubai and pours them both a glass. As they munch and sip, he starts venting about some jerks who went back on their word even after signing some award letter. Yeon Wu chimes in, saying she heard he worked super hard on that project. But he brushes it off, saying it's just part of the job. Then, out of the corner of her eye, Yeon Wu spots a jewelry ring box in his hand, and all those office rumors come flooding back. She inquires about the ring, asking if it's meant for her. He casually responds, who else would it be for? Then, she mentions the tabloid rumors, and he dismisses them, clarifying he hasn't even proposed yet. When she directly asks if she's the one he plans to propose to, he confidently affirms, yes, you. Yeon Woo jumps up, raising her voice, asking if he really thinks it's a good idea for them to tie the knot. She points out that aside from their physical attraction, what else about them is compatible? Their families, backgrounds, and even their wealth couldn't be more different. They are like polar opposites in society. It's like they are from different planets. Lee grabs her bag and points out how they are always meeting up, yet she's suggesting he marry someone else. Yeon was like, yeah, obviously. He questions if she even knows what she's talking about, and she confidently responds that she does, asking him to give her purse back. He asks if she's suggesting he should have an arranged marriage, but still keep her as a mistress, just like his dad did. Yeon Wu responds that she can't marry him because she's witnessed the kind of life he's been living. Even though they're not blood-related, they should still treat each other like siblings. He sarcastically remarks that he must be a scumbag who sleeps with his sister then. She urges him to chill out and think logically. 
getting married just isn't in the cards for them. But he grabs her from behind and points out they've been in this together for two whole years. Could she really just go off and meet someone else now? She responds that if she could turn back time, she'd go back to when he used to ignore and despise her. It would have been easier if she'd just hated him back. She regrets trying to impress him back when he was just a jerk. There's a reason why she always reached out to Director Lee the moment she left that house. Living together as siblings was suffocating. All she wanted was for them to become total strangers. It's like she's longing for a fresh start, away from all the tangled emotions. Release her. He's adamant and offers her the ring, but she's equally determined, saying she'd rather die than wear it. He persists, expressing that he only wants her and nobody else. It's a tense moment as they confront their F.E. He slams the box shut and tosses it away, accidentally cutting his face in the process. She checks if he's all right, and he brushes it off, saying his face isn't the only thing hurting. She insists he gets it treated, announcing she's leaving. But he grabs her, pouring out his heart, saying he loves her. She thinks he's being absurd, but he's adamant, saying he can't imagine life without her. Then, without warning, he pulls her close and starts kissing her passionately. They've always had this kind of connection. He tells her he won't ask for anything more, so she should at least desire him for his body. He wants her to say that's what she wants. And before long, they are getting intimate. It's like they've always craved each other's touch. It feels like they've reached a point of no return. While Lee snoozes away, Yeonwoo takes a moment to watch him. Then, she gets up and heads for a shower. After she's all cleaned up, she checks out his wardrobe and spots clothes, shoes, and bags all for her. She wonders if he got all this new stuff, because she once mentioned that the last things he got were too pricey. She picks out a bag, figuring it shouldn't hurt to use it. At the office, Yeonwoo tells Yungmi that if she had known Yungmi would be there early, she would have grabbed a coffee for her too. Yungmi reassures her it's no big deal, explaining she showed up early because of a photo shoot for the golf course construction in Yangsan. She's almost done with it. After a quick chat about notebooks, Yeonwoo mentions that since they are always low on them and she forgot to write her name on hers, Yungmi can just take it. Yungmi wonders what Yeonwoo will use, and Yeonwoo casually drops the bomb that she actually handed in her resignation letter about a month ago. She figures it'll be processed soon. Yungmi's surprised, asking if Yeonwoo's really quitting. Yeonwoo nods, saying that's how things ended up. Yungmi admits she's ended up depending on Yeonwoo for a lot of stuff. Yeonwoo returns the sentiment, saying she's received plenty of help from Yungmi too. She thanks her for everything and suggests they split her coffee if Yungmi's in a rush. They haven't even started drinking it yet, so they both share the coffee, wrapping up their chat on a friendly note. Yungmi spots Yeonwoo's bag and compliments its quality, mentioning it looks like a knockoff Hermes. Yeonwoo shrugs, saying she's not sure, she just saw it on the street and thought it looked comfy, so she grabbed it. Yungmi asks her to remember where she got it and let her know, because even for a fake, it's a pretty nice bag. As Yeonwoo is carrying some files, her stomach starts to ache. She thinks to herself that it shouldn't be time for her period yet. She heads to the bathroom to take care of things. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, employees are gossiping about Yeonwoo buying a Hermes bag. They are wondering how she can afford it. Someone else mentions seeing Yeonwoo going to the director's office a few times too. They are saying Yeonwoo might not dress flashy, but sometimes she brings in pricey stuff. She figures as long as there aren't any logos or fancy decorations, people won't notice. Then, someone wonders why someone like Director Lee would be with Yeonwoo when he could be dating actresses. Another person chimes in, saying Yeonwoo seems kind of fragile looking and to be honest, her looks aren't all that impressive. But they reckon there must be something else about her that's impressive. After the girls leave, Yeonwoo comes out, feeling kinda resigned. 
She figures this gossip was bound to happen sooner or later, but she knows it'll blow over soon anyway. That afternoon, the manager calls her to confirm her resignation. He mentions they'll have some new employees coming in tomorrow, so she should help with the transition. Once he's gone, she mutters to herself that her resignation should have been confirmed while Seo Kian Lee was still away on his business trip. As Yeon Wu is about to close up, her landlord gives her a ring. He mentions her grandfather wants her to swing by today. Yeon Wu sighs, hoping her grandfather didn't spill anything to him yesterday. If he did, she's not letting it slide. But the landlord reassures her not to stress. He'll wait until she gives him the green light before he says anything. As she's walking, Yeonwu realizes it'll take ages to get there by bus. Suddenly, Lee pulls up in his car and honks. Getting in, she mentions she planned to take the bus. He wonders why she's so grumpy today and if work's been tough lately. He offers to transfer another employee to PR team too or suggests she could quit altogether. Holding her hand, he admits he doesn't like seeing her working under other people. He brings up his marriage proposal, admitting it might have been a bit out of the blue. But he's cool with waiting until she's ready. They arrive at her grandfather's house, where a woman informs them he's waiting in the dining room. However, she gives Yeonwu a suspicious glance as they enter. In the dining room, the grandfather welcomes them in mentioning he received some giant yellowtail from Jeju Island. Seeing it reminded him of Yeonwu. The woman adds that Yeonwu should visit more often, maybe he's been feeling lonely. The grandfather talks about Yeonwu a lot, expressing concern for her well-being while she's working. He also tells Lee to always look out for Yeonwu like she's his little sister. Lee interjects, saying strictly speaking, Yeonwu isn't his little sister. The grandfather shakes his head, commenting that Lee still hasn't grown up. He recalls a moment eight years ago, when he brought Yeonwu in and told Lee that she would be his little sister. He urged Lee to take good care of her, but Lee refused to accept her as his sister. Nowadays, the grandfather remarks that Yeonwu has been living with them for so long that she might as well be his little sister. He wonders if they should have developed some sort of sibling bond by now, considering they've been through tough times together. Yeonwu promises to visit him more often, but explains that she's still learning a lot at work and tends to pass out as soon as she gets home. After a quick chat about herbal medicine, they dig into their meal. Soon enough, the woman brings up to Lee that his grandfather has been bugging her to find him a good match. He's 32 now, so it's time for him to start thinking about settling down. The grandfather and the woman discuss how one of the potential matches won't work out. Lee asserts that he'll take care of his marriage arrangements himself. The grandfather then asks if he's currently seeing someone, to which Lee simply responds with a yes. Later that night, as Yeonwu lies on her bed, she figures she'll have to stick around for breakfast since the grandfather was so insistent. Just then, she gets a message from Seo Kian Lee asking her to come meet him in his room. He's got something to show her. She heads over to meet him, and he pulls her onto the sofa, wrapping his arms around her from behind. They start chatting about orchids. Lee admits he's willing to go to this length just to see her smile. He envisions a future where they have children, and he wants them to witness her caring for the orchids. Yeonwu remarks that he doesn't even enjoy being around children. Lee counters, asking if there's any man who could truly hate his own kids. He admits there is one, his father. Nevertheless, he plans to fill the newly expanded garden with orchids named after her. He kisses her gently and confesses that if she hadn't been in his life, he would have felt halfway to insanity by now. She disagrees, insisting he would have found a way to cope no matter what. But he's adamant saying he's serious about not being able to live without her. He leans in for another kiss and guides her onto the bed. She hesitates, saying they shouldn't be doing this here, but he hushes her, reassuring her everything will be fine. And with that, they begin to intimately connect, caught up in the heat of the moment. 
Once they finish, she mentions she's going to catch some sleep because she's exhausted. He agrees, but refuses to let go of her hand. Then, he slips a ring onto her finger. She thinks to herself that he's trying to tie her down again like this. She figures she just needs to endure him for two more days before she can finally make her getaway for good. Yeonwu thinks to herself that it would have been easier if their relationship had just been casual, with no emotional attachments. As she heads to her room, the woman spots her and they both decide to have a chat. The woman expresses her certainty that Yeonwu understands the importance of Seo Kian's marriage. After his mother's suicide, she must have heard about the immense pressure Jiel Bank put on Mari construction. No matter how stable a company appears, it's all in jeopardy the moment its financial stability is compromised. The woman explains that she set her sights on the daughter of someone bank for Seo Kian's sake. She had a feeling something like this would happen ever since her father-in-law treated her like a daughter. It's common knowledge that those with nothing will do whatever it takes to get something. Sure, she might have had a tough time in the house too, but her life has been unbearable since Yeonwu arrived. She's pleading with Yeonwu to please stay out of her life and her son's lives. She passes over a check and states that she won't ask a second time. It's more than sufficient for Yeonwu to relocate to a rural area and start her own business. It's a straightforward offer, suggesting a fresh start away from the current situation. The next morning, Grandfather Lee suggests they all have breakfast now that Yeonwu is awake. The daughter-in-law inquires if Yeonwu slept well, wondering if it was challenging to sleep in a different bed. Yeonwu thinks to herself that the daughter-in-law looks completely different from last night. Reflecting on last night, the daughter-in-law asks Yeonwu if she's using proper birth control. She emphasizes that clinging onto a man with a promising future while being careless with her body is truly unacceptable. Back in the present, as usual, Yeonwu responds to the daughter-in-law in a way that doesn't truly reflect how she feels. As they all eat, Grandfather mentions that next year, once all the tax issues are sorted out, he plans to transfer some stocks to Yeonwu's name. She insists he doesn't have to, but he insists that he does. He explains that after finally accepting her into the family, he's gained a lot of strength because of her. It's not like he doesn't have plenty to share, of course, he should be spreading his wealth among his children. As they continue eating, Yeonwu thinks to herself that it'll all be over by tomorrow, she just has to hang in there until then. After breakfast, Grandfather mentions that he guesses the next time he'll see her will be on New Year's Day. She gives him a hug and reminds him to take care of himself. She tells him that no matter where she is, she's always thinking and worrying about him. At the office, Yeonwu passes a note to one of the staff, telling her that if she ever needs to ask something, she can send her an email there. Yeonwu talks with manager Jung about her departure. She doesn't want to give too many details because she's afraid Jung will gossip about her once she leaves. Jung starts bothering Yeonwu by bringing up Director Lee and how Yeonwu seems to have more privileges than her. Just then, a man interrupts, saying there's a call for Yeonwu from the executive director's office. Her heart sinks at the mention of the executive director's office. As she enters, she asks why he called. He shoves a document in her face and demands to know what it is. Grabbing her, he accuses her of planning all this behind his back. He points out that the date on the resignation letter is from when he was still in Dubai. She denies it, saying she didn't plan anything. He questions why she didn't mention quitting until her last day. She explains that she's quitting because she needs a break and the work here doesn't fit her. Inside, she's relieved that she's almost done, she just needs to keep deceiving him a bit longer. She tells him this, and he confesses that he wanted them to get married. Hearing this, she feels like resigning was the right decision. She mentions she wants to learn how to cook, study a bit more, and do some traveling. Lee responds that if that was her reason, she should have told him earlier. She explains he was busy with work during his trip to Dubai, and he understands. Since her resignation was confirmed anyway, 
He suggests they go ahead with her plans. He suggests buying her a car so she can pursue her interests freely. He promises to seek his grandfather's permission for their marriage later on. Hugging her, he expresses his happiness that she agreed to marry him. He asks what she wants to learn next and suggests moving in with him. He assures her that he'll find a private tutor so she can explore whatever she desires. He mentions he'll move in with her once they get her grandfather's blessing. She agrees and says she's leaving now to say goodbye to her co-workers. Lee hugs her from behind and apologizes for suddenly yelling at her earlier, admitting he scared her. He suggests having a party on Saturday to celebrate her resignation and promises to prepare her favorite rose wine. As Yeon Wu is carrying her box to leave, Yung Mu rushes in, exclaiming how she can't leave without saying goodbye. Yeon Wu explains she thought Yung Mu was out. Yung Mu hands her a gift, insisting that since she's going to travel, she should wear the lipstick she's giving her and send a selfie from her destination. They should plan a casual meetup sometime soon. Yeon Wu wasn't just relieved about leaving, there were mixed emotions. Despite the tough moments, Myri Construction was her first job ever. Maybe that's why it's been hard for her to walk away for so long. As Yeon Wu boards the bus out of the city, she crafts lies in her texts to Lee. She says inwardly that by tomorrow afternoon, her number might not even work anymore. Although breaking up will be tough and painful for her initially, she genuinely hopes he'll find happiness in the end. Later that day, she arrives at her destination and heads to her grandfather's grave. She pours a drink on the grave, explaining that she came earlier this time, because she might not be able to make it on the anniversary of his passing. She quit her job yesterday, so she could do what she wants before she gets too old. She asks her grandfather to watch over her so things can go well. Eight years ago, on a cloudy winter day, when she was 19 years old, her grandpa seemed sad as he closed down his nursery due to financial problems. Until then, she had believed there were many happy days ahead of her. When they reached the house of the Myri Constructions chairman, it was much grander than their farmhouse in Huizong. At that time, she didn't understand the significance of the daughter-in-law's lingering gaze behind her. She was so naive back then. Yeon Wu, her grandfather, and Chairman Lee chat about plants, sharing stories and laughing together. As they drive back after delivering the orchids to Chairman Lee's house, it begins to snow. Sitting in the car with her grandfather, they chat casually. When he brings up Chairman Lee's house, the first thing that pops into her head is the expression on the daughter-in-law's face. Yeon Wu and her grandfather both get into an accident. When Yeon Wu snaps back to reality, she sees half of her grandpa's body trapped in the crushed truck. She bangs on the broken window, but it won't open, and she cries out for someone to help save her grandpa. As his consciousness fades, her grandpa expresses concern for her. He assures her that he'll watch over her from above, ensuring everything goes well for her. Those were his last words. Yeon Wu's grandfather's funeral became an elaborate affair, a grand event orchestrated by the chairman of Mari Construction, who took charge of all the arrangements. It was a gesture of immense kindness, one that left a lasting impression on Yeon Wu. With her grandfather's passing, she found herself suddenly orphaned, thrust into a world of uncertainty. However, the chairman stepped in, offering her a lifeline by bringing her to Seoul and assuming the role of her guardian. In the midst of her grief, Yeon Wu felt adrift, grappling with the loss of her only family. Yet, Chairman Lee's unwavering support provided her with a sense of stability and comfort during those tumultuous days. He became a constant presence in her life, offering solace and guidance as she navigated through the pain of her loss. Whether it was attending to her needs or offering a shoulder to lean on, Chairman Lee was there for her, tirelessly tending to her well-being day and night. Three days later, Chairman Lee sat with Yeon Wu, urging her to eat as much as she wanted. He comforted her with kind words. Meanwhile, outside, the daughter-in-law watched with envy. She felt resentful, thinking Chairman Lee didn't care about her own daughter's death. 
Chairman Lee then had a conversation with Zhang Gei. He sympathized with her loss of her daughter due to a weak heart, and he mentioned Yeon Wu's situation. He expressed his hope that Zhang Gei would treat Yeon Wu like her own daughter. He then turned to the maids, Mun San and Zhang Gen, instructing them to pay special attention to Yeon Wu and take good care of her. That day, Yeon Wu met Chairman Lee's grandson, Lee Seo Kian, for the first time. He seemed distant and uninterested. It brought back tough and hurtful memories from when she was 19 years old. Now, Yeon Wu tells her grandpa that she had to leave the house because Chairman Lee showed her so much kindness by taking her in as his granddaughter when she had nowhere else to go. No matter where she goes, she believes she'll have a good life, and she promises to return soon. She didn't want to disgrace her grandpa's name, who had raised her all on his own. She takes out her SIM card and throws it away. Meanwhile, at Lee's house, he waits for Yeon Wu, growing increasingly worried as she's running late. He tries calling her, but the number is no longer in service. Worried, he rushes to her house, where he finds a woman cleaning. She explains that she was asked by the owner to clean the place for the new tenant. He calls Yeon Wu's friend at work, but they have no information about her. Frustrated, he continues to try calling her, but the number doesn't connect. He waits all night for Yeon Wu, but she doesn't come, and he can't reach her. In the end, he realizes he's been abandoned. If you're eager to know what becomes of Yeon Wu and her relationship with Lee, drop a comment expressing your interest in a part 2. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Until next time, ciao.